Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk from the online seminar series Progress and Visions in the Scientific Study of the Mind-Matter Relation, held in 2018. The seminars aim to bring together researchers from around the globe with a background in mathematics or physics who are interested in the scientific study of consciousness and the mind-matter relation. While each seminar session consists of a talk and a discussion, the latter is not recorded and the following video will only contain the talk. We hope you enjoy it. For further information, please visit mind-matter-relation.org. So this is um, a proposal to use humans to switch the settings in a, a Bell experiment. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll, um, before I get to the actual proposal, I'll just give the sort of background. And much of this may be very familiar uh, to people here, but I think it's worth going over um, the, the sort of basic sort of philosophical issues uh, of uh, of consciousness, um, just to, so we sort of know what kind of thing is being um, tested. Um, so I'll talk about consciousness uh, and also Turing type tests. So Turing type tests are sort of slightly broader category than the Turing tests that, um, that Alan Turing came up with, but you'll, you'll see what I mean uh, shortly. Um, so first of all, um, uh, there's three basic types of ontological accounts for consciousness. Um, there's also idealism, which, which you may think of as, a, as an ontological account. In any case, idealism is, is where you imagine that, um, you know, that, that basically all, all reality is, is just mental. It's just um, made out of thoughts. Um, so the other three accounts, the sort of more ontological accounts, uh, are, um, are, are, are on the screen. Um, and you see I've got um, two rows and two columns. So in the columns, I have um, either that there's no fundamental consciousness property uh, uh, or there is a fundamental consciousness property uh, being added. Uh, and in the rows, I have that there's only matter uh, or that you have ma uh, mind added, so mind in addition to matter. Um, so, um, so the three possibilities. Well, first one is uh, just straightforward uh, vanilla materialism. So this is... Uh, uh, Okay, well, this is um, basically the idea that you have some sort of model of, uh, you know, the universe just an entirely materialist account. Uh, and at that fundamental level, uh, nowhere is consciousness mentioned. Uh, so if you look, uh, here's, here's a, you know, an example, the standard model of, of elementary particles. This is just one example. And you'll see in particular that there's no um, consciousness boson, for example. Um, there's no, uh, you know, there's no... Um, top consciousness quark or anything like that. Um, so, and of course, it doesn't have to be the standard model of elementary physics. It could be something else, but it's a sort of a standard materialist model in which um, uh, consciousness isn't uh, posited at the fundamental uh, level. Um, and then the big problem for this kind of uh, approach is, is uh, what David Chalmers has called the hard problem of consciousness, uh, which I'm sure has been sp uh, spoken about in previous um, talks. This is the problem of accounting for uh, the existence of qualia, the existence of feelings uh, uh, and sensation, things like the color red. Um, it's difficult to see how the color red, the, the sensation of the color red is going to emerge um, out of this um, uh, sort of simple um, materialist account of uh, things. Okay, so that's an argument that's been well uh, rehearsed. The second sort of account um, is, um, well, now you have only matter, but, um, but you also have some fundamental consciousness type property added to matter. Um, and um, so, and this is, this is panpsychism. So you can think of this like following. So here's, here's um, imagine that you have the, the physical world. So I'm showing in the picture just a small part of the physical world. Um, you know, but imagine the whole universe. Uh, and then, um, uh, in addition to the sort of atoms and, and whatever make up the materialist account of the world, there's also some kind of glitter, sort of consciousness glitter spread throughout the whole universe. Uh, and, um, and, and this is what um, accounts for the existence of, of consciousness, what, it make, what makes consciousness uh, possible. So in this uh, type of approach, um, uh, you know, the whole universe is in some sense endowed with the property of uh, consciousness. The third type of account um, um, is mind-matter duality. Um, so this is where you have um, 
um, uh, matter, so which may be described, for example, by the um, the, the standard model, um, something like that. Then, in addition, you have mind added uh, to matter. So, sorry, mind added. So, mind is a separate um, property. Uh, and so, this this idea goes back to um, Rene Descartes in 1641. Uh, and uh, you have um, well, here's a picture of Rene Descartes, and here's a a picture that's meant to represent this. I don't quite understand how it does. Uh, in any case, somehow the mind is acting. I think this is the pineal gland. The mind is acting on the brain in some way, uh, and also the brain is acting on the mind. And so um, you have this kind of mind matter duality. Um, so that this is the approach that I'm interested in in testing, um, and um, so I'll talk about it a bit more. Um, so one one particular concern about mind matter duality that you often read in philosophical uh, textbooks is um, it is, is that the, that it, it may be epiphenomenal. So if if matter if the, if the world of matter is in some sense closed, uh, you know it it, um, it behaves according to its own laws, then it seems like there's no place for mind to come in from the outside and make changes. So you could imagine mind passively observing uh, matter, um, but um, but if you take this argument that the world is sort of somehow causally closed, then it's not possible for matter to influence mind. Um, it, it strikes me that this isn't a very good argument because if we're going to take on you know, as radical a belief as mind-matter duality, then we might expect other things to change as well. In particular, the idea that matter, the world of matter is somehow causally closed. Um, so, um, so it doesn't seem to me to be a terribly strong argument. The, the idea that um, energy is conserved and momentum is conserved, for example, um, there's, you know, there's, there's, uh, these things seem to be sort of true to some extent, but I don't think um, breaking those in the case where you have um, um, some non-physical mind added into the picture is is is, is terribly um, radical. After you've already made the radical step step of introducing um, some sort of non-physical mind. Um, incidentally, the mind. I mean, although one is describing it as non-physical, it's not. It's it's still ontological. There's, a, you know, in in such a picture, you still imagine that these minds exist in some sense, um, that just exist in a, in a different kind of realm um, from, from, from the, um, the, the matter. Um, so an argument against epiphenomenalism, which goes um, back to my supervisor, Ewan Squires, is um, if you look in the dictionary, you'll find the word consciousness uh, in black ink. Okay, and uh, here is a scan I took from an online dictionary. Um, and you can see there is the word consciousness. So the, the ink atoms uh, must have been influenced, um, presumably indirectly, uh, by whatever it is uh, that's responsible uh, in the ontology for consciousness. It's difficult to imagine that the atoms in, this, um, in, in, in the word consciousness in the dictionary could have gotten into that configuration sort of incidentally without um, whatever it was that's responsible for consciousness somehow being involved. Um, so this is an argument that it seems that Matt, that that um, that whatever it is that you mind that causes uh, consciousness would have to be involved in, in acting on matter. It's an argument against epiphenomenalism. Um, so when I was preparing these slides, I thought it would be better if I took a, a photograph of a dictionary instead of just taking a scan on the internet, because then you'd be able to see a photograph of the actual int at, uh, atoms. Uh, and so I asked my wife, because um, I was at a conference, I asked my wife to photograph a dictionary and send me the pictures. Um, but because we were um, painting our house, the only dictionary we had available was the Scrabble dictionary. Uh, and here it is. Uh, and I don't know if you can see that, but in the Scrabble dictionary, it turns out the word uh, consciousness, or even the word conscious, uh, is missing. Um, although, if you look on the front cover, the words selfie, chillax, and geocache are added. Uh, they're new in the, um, in the fifth edition. Um, so it goes straight from conquion to consent. Uh, so that suggests that uh, Scrabble players are, are zombies. You know, in the philosophical literature, uh, uh, people, uh, you know, uh, bodies that have all the same attributes as us, except consciousness, they, they typically call them conscious. So they call them um, zombies. Uh, and so um, so here's, here's a picture of some zombies uh, who play Scrabble, apparently. Um, OK, so but going back to the argument against op epiphenomenalism, um, um, since the word consciousness does appear in most dictionaries, uh, we conclude that the behavior of matter uh, 
uh, can be affected by the ontological elements that are responsible for consciousness. So from the Cartesian dualist point of view, you can tell a story in which the, which the mind acts on the brain and thereby imparts information into the physical world and somewhere down the line that will lead to um, certain configurations of um, atoms, of ink atoms in a dictionary. Um, so in order for that to happen, it seems clear that um, atoms that are actually inside the brain would have to violate the laws of physics, the, the, the standard laws of, uh, of, of, of sort of the material uh, uh, world. So um, if that were true, then in principle, we could look inside the, the brain, I should say brain there, we could look inside the brain uh, uh, and see these atoms behaving in, in a different way, you know, see them violating the, um, the, the, the standard laws of physics. Uh, an experiment like that would be very, very difficult to do. Uh, first of all, the brain is an incredibly messy environment. Uh, uh, atoms are not uh, uh, isolated, so it's difficult to know exactly how they should behave according to the sort of fundamental laws of physics. Um, and, and furthermore, um, you need to be sure you know what the correct laws of physics are uh, for, for this situation. Um, so this is a, so although in, in principle, you should be able to do an experiment like this. Uh, in practice, it's very difficult to imagine doing an experiment where you look inside um, uh, a brain and, and see the atoms behaving in a different way and, and posit that as evidence for mind matter duality. Um, so, um, so we need a, a different um, kind of approach. Um, so an approach like this was given by um, the man shown in the, um, in the picture on the previous slide. Um, so this is the, um, the Turing test, which I'm sure everybody knows, but let me just go over it once more. So here we imagine a situation where we have uh, an interrogator, some person, uh, and uh, he has a, an interface, a computer. So in this modern version, he has a laptop. Uh, but when Alan, Alan Turing wrote that down, they didn't have laptops. It would have been some different kind of a computer interface. Um, and then there's a screen. And on the other side of the screen, there's either uh, another human also having a laptop or uh, some AI system. Uh, and now the interrogator asks questions um, across this interface and tries to establish whether or not um, there's a human on the other side or, um, or uh, an AI system. Okay. Uh, and uh, after a while, um, the, um, you know, the, 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 um, the interrogator says, okay, I've come to my um, conclusion that this is a human or this is an AI system. And indeed, uh, I think it's an, there's an annual, I think an annual um, competition for um, software programmers to um, attempt to outwit um, interrogators uh, with their, their programs. And uh, so far, I, I think the humans are still winning, but, um, but um, eventually uh, maybe um, um, computers will be better than humans, or we'll, we'll be able to, um, uh, convince um, interrogators that they are they are human over this interface. Um, there's something a bit odd about this experiment because the AI system, in some sense, has to be programmed to be fundamentally dishonest. It has to intimidate, sorry, in, in imitate the um, the uh, human. And um, you know, if if it's asked a question like "Are you a human?", it will certainly say yes, uh, because otherwise it would fail. So it's a sort of odd kind of experiment. But nevertheless. There's something um, compelling about this, you know, because you have this uh, simple interface where there's classical information flowing backwards and forwards. Um, it seems like a very good way to avoid, um, you know, having to look inside the brain and see if atoms are behaving in, in a different way. Um, so Alan Turing himself, um, uh, of course, believed that you could ultimately um, program a computer to behave. Uh, uh, to pass this test, so so that there isn't fundamentally any difference between, you know, brains and suitably programmed um, computers. Um, on the other hand, if you read his paper, he, it's it's a very beautiful paper, and he's incredibly open-minded, and he discusses all sorts of, you know, uh, uh, crazy explanations, including you know ESP. He also discusses ESP in the, in this um, paper. Uh, so it's uh, it's a very uh, open-minded paper. Uh, so if we take the basic idea that Alan Turing had. And we can talk about a more general category of tests. So I'm calling these um, Turing type tests. So here's the idea. We take people or artificial um, um, or, or some sort of artificial devices, and we put them inside um, boxes, so figurative boxes. We don't, have, we don't have to actually put people inside these boxes, but uh, they're just meant to indicate that we have them uh, in a separate kind of chamber. 
uh, and we may have more than one person. You know, in the previous slide, we only had one um, one person being interrogated. Um, and then we allow classical information to pass in and out of the boxes. Uh, so this is a more general category of um, tests that we can consider. And now if real people can do something that the artificial devices cannot do, then we have um, evidence for mind-matter duality. On the other hand, if uh, real people uh, uh, can always be imitated by these artificial devices, then that speaks against mind-matter duality. Okay, so now I'm going to come to um, to um, the actual proposed experiment. Well, first of all, some background. So I think probably most people watching this talk are familiar with this, but um, but let me go through it uh, anyway. Um, these slides were initially prepared for a more general audience, but I'll stick with them. Um, so a Bell experiment looks like this. We have um, a source and uh, a pair of entangled particles are emitted, one in each direction towards um, some apparatuses. Um, and then at each apparatus, we have a choice of setting. Okay, so we have either setting A for this, this measurement, or uh, uh, sorry, either, either one setting or another. So we have a choice of setting for the setting A. It can be, usually it's chosen to be one of two values. And then at the other end, we have a choice of setting B. That's usually chosen to be one of two values. And now we make an assumption, we assume locality. So we assume that the outcome at NB does not depend on the choice of setting at end A. And likewise, the outcome at end A does not depend on the choice of setting at end B. Um, so under that assumption, John Bell was able to show that a certain correlation function is bounded. Uh, and so here we have, they have the correlation function is bounded. It has to be less than or equal to a certain value two. So this correlation just measures a certain, you know, it's just a certain um, correlation function on the outcomes, uh, the two ends for different settings. However, uh, quantum theory predicts that this correlation will take the value 2.8. So quantum theory seems to violate um, these uh, assumptions of locality. Um, uh, in, uh, it seems in quantum theory that one end seems to know what the setting at the other end is. Okay. So um, in these kinds of experiments, people uh, worry about imposing locality conditions. So um, we argue that there's a need to switch the setting at one end, so there's no time for the information about the new setting to reach the other end. So we switch the setting at end A, and then here's a light speed signal traveling out in red, uh, and we want to perform the measurement at NB before there's been time for information about the new value of the setting um, to reach the other end. In actual experiments, the switching is uh, usually done by a, a random number generator. So the first experiment actually to use switching was done by Alain Aspect in um, 1982, I think. Um, and uh, he used um, uh, a, 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 a quasi-periodic um, switching, the, 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 um, it was a sort of opto-acoustical modulator that would, um, so that the light would get sent either one way or the other. Um, but it was, it was actually periodic uh, instead of being random. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, I was, as was pointed out later by um, Anton Zeilinger, the switching was just exactly such that by the time the photon would have reached the other end from the, the source, uh, the, the, the um, the uh, switch would have been set back to its original value. Um, so um, so, um, so that, that seemed unfortunate. And it shows that you have to be careful in thinking about how to do these kinds of things. Um, but more generally, so starting with, um, I think Anton Dallinger was the first to do an experiment where switching was done using some kind of random number generator. And since then, uh, many experiments have been done like this. Um, um, but there's a problem with random uh, number generators. Uh, what if the random number generator is really a deterministic machine? Okay, so so you might think it's random because you can't predict uh, what uh, what um, what the um, what the choice is going to be, what the number that comes out is going to be. Um, but actually, there could be some kind of hidden state, um, uh, you know, a, a, some earlier hidden state that the machine has 
um, that can be used to predict the future state. So if that's the case, then the earlier hidden state could be broadcast uh, so as to reach the other end uh, in time. Um, and so then you'd have uh, the information about the actual setting uh, available at the other end, as it would be inferred from this um, this um, hidden state. So um, in this case, random number generators are not sufficient um, to um, um, to a real to impose the locality conditions. So, so this is where the idea of using humans uh, comes in. So if the interventions on mind of mind on matter cannot be anticipated by the laws that operate at the physical level, um, then the locality conditions can be imposed uh, in a Bell experiment if we use humans to switch the settings. So here's um, a sort of Gedanken version of the experiment. And we imagine that we have a human at each end. Uh, they make a choice between one of two settings by pressing um, you know, one of two buttons. Uh, and, um, and then you have to get the timing such the information about the um, choice of measurement uh, from each end hasn't reached the other end whilst the measurements are being made. Um, so the key thing here is that these um, these choices that humans make are in some sense interventions. Now certainly, if they are free choices, if humans have free will, even though the physical world is um, say deterministic, um, then that would count. But it could also be that the humans are deterministic, but that the deterministic, the deterministic rules that govern uh, human behavior are, some, so to speak, in a different realm, uh, and so cannot be anticipated at, at the physical level. Um, so this this sort of argument uh, it would it would provide you know evidence for mind matter. So it would provide evidence for free will, but it wouldn't entirely um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't entirely prove that there was free will. Okay. So so far, of course, no experiments have actually been done with humans. It's, it's interesting because if people often talk, you know, just, just as a manner of speaking, they say things like, well, you switch the um, setting at one end, and then, you know, then you're switching, someone else switches the setting at the other end. People often talk in those terms. Um, but that's just a way of speaking. Uh, you know, people often say things like, you know, you set the initial conditions, uh, um, but no one actually sets the initial conditions. Um, you know, likewise in these experiments, people often talk in these terms, but actually um, um, that's, that isn't what's done. Um, and um, and it's actually very difficult to do the experiment with humans, as I'll discuss. Uh, so, so far, the experiment certainly hasn't been done with humans. Um, anyway, before we proceed on to the actual proposal, it's worth looking at how this fits in with the remarks I was making earlier. So here we have, we can imagine an experiment in which uh, we have um, either humans doing the switching at each end, or we have some sort of um, AI devices um uh doing the switching and so here um the a a ai stands for artificial interventions uh, so they could be um, random number generators or they could be more complicated computers that are um that might be used to pass the turing test uh whatever whatever system you want uh you could put in here whatever artificial system you want um and then we want to contrast the two situations um if it's the case that when we have humans doing the switching, we start to see a violation of Bell's inequalities uh, in the direction, sorry, we start to see a violation of quantum theory in the direction of satisfying Bell's inequalities. Um, and of course, if we, if, we, if we manage to impose the locality conditions in every case, then we would exactly satisfy the Bell inequalities. Um, if we see that, uh, then we would have um, the kind of evidence uh, we're looking for, some evidence for mind-matter uh, duality. I'll talk about that in more detail later. Yeah, so this is indeed a Turing-type test. It, it belongs to the category of um, tests I outlined earlier, um, where we, we put um, humans or artificial devices in, in boxes, um, and then we only allow classical communication uh, into and out of that box. Actually, in this case, we only need to have classical communication out of the boxes. There's no need to send information into the boxes. Um, okay. Uh, one difference between this test and the test that Turing proposed is that it's objective. So in the case of the Turing test, um, the interrogators have to um, make a subjective decision as to whether they think it's a human or a, a computer. 
an artificial device inside the box. In this case, it's an objective matter of the fact as to whether the bell inequalities are, are violated or not, at least as to what the um, what the value of the correlation function is. So, um, you know, if, if if it worked, it would be a stronger test of this kind of hypothesis. Okay, so um, so that that was a sort of Gedanken version of the experiment. Now, let me discuss an actual proposed experiment. Um, well, first of all, um, we need to get human inputs. Uh, we could imagine um, having um, humans push a button. So, you know, here's an example of a human who has one of two buttons to push, um, uh, the one on the left or the one on the right. Uh, now, it turns out that um, you can predict uh, about one-tenth of a second earlier than the button is actually pressed what choice a human will make. So this has been done in um, in um, in um, uh, in the in the context of typing. If you have people typing, and you uh, attach uh, EEG headsets to them, then um, then um, you can predict from the e from the EEG signal uh, one tenth of a second earlier uh, what uh, what they're going to type with about ninety percent accuracy. Um, in one tenth of a second, uh, a light speed signal can travel. Uh, several times the radius of the Earth. Uh, so that means that in order to impose locality conditions where people press buttons, you'd have to have an experiment that was um, that was you know on the level of the solar system. It would have to be you know you'd have to have people or a person um, um, uh, somewhere else, you know, not on planet Earth but somewhere uh, far away. Um, and that's uh, that's certainly um, uh, quite a difficult experiment to do. Um, so what I propose instead is to use EEG signals directly. Okay, so the idea is um, you engage people in some appropriate kind of behavior where, where you know, you imagine they're, they're making choices. It doesn't really matter what the choices are, um, although well, maybe it would matter what the choices are, but, but um, that's something to be discussed. So maybe they're doing calculations, maybe they're pressing a button where they, you know, choose um, one of two options, um, uh, some kind of appropriate choicey behavior. And then you connect, uh, you use the um, EEG headset to collect um, um, the, 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 the signal directly. And then you take that electrical signal and you feed it into the um, switching on the Bell experiment. Um, you may want to do some appropriate um, pre-processing of the signal first. Um, although um, any pre-processing of the signal shouldn't induce um, too much extra delay, because if you do, you lose the advantage. Um, Okay, so um, so I wrote an explicit proposal of how to do this uh, in a paper uh, in uh, in uh, last year, um, almost a year ago. And so the idea is that you have um, well, a bell experiment. At each end, you have a box that chooses the the setting, and then that box has uh, um, uh, is uh, has some maybe there, maybe there's some antenna, and there's a relay station. And then you have a bunch of humans, each of them are wearing um, EEG headsets, uh, which are, say, Bluetooth enabled. Uh, and so this, the outcome from their, um, their EEG headset uh, is, is sent via radio frequency to the relay station and then rebroadcast so that it goes into the switching. Uh, and so you do that at both ends. Uh, I proposed in the, exper in the paper uh, that we'd have, um, excuse me, Chair entanglement over 100 kilometers um, between, you know, this could be uh, at altitude between two remote locations. Then, um, then you could have the people uh, uh, at each end on either side of the experiment in some in towns, and then you relay the signal up via radio frequency, and you have like 100 people at each end. So, um, so total of 200 people, 100 kilometers. If you assume that um, each person has an intervention rate of um, 10 hertz. So if you assume that people are able to, um, you know, have 10 acts of free will or 10 interventions, whatever it is, um, per second, 10 acts of you know, mind on matter per second, then in the experiment I'm proposing here, you'd see about a 1% effect. So in 1% of cases, uh, the locality conditions would be satisfied so that there was, um, so you'd be doing, a, in some sense, a true Bell experiment. And in those 1% of cases, Bell's inequalities 
would um, be satisfied un under these assumptions. And so we see a 1% violation of quantum theory, at least a 1% violation of quantum theory. Um, so, um, so that was um, May in 2017. Um, but now um, there's the beginning of an actual experiment because in, in, um, in July of 2017, this paper appeared on the internet. So this um, is a satellite-based entanglement distribution over 1,200 kilometers. Uh, so the, the 100 kilometers I chose earlier, uh, I based that number on the um, the rough distance that was uh, achieved by um, Anton Zeilinger's uh, team uh, using uh, entanglement distribution in, in the Canary Islands, so using a telescope to send um, one of the particles over about 100 kilometers. Uh, uh, this is this this experiment is kind of a game changer. This is entanglement distribution over over uh, more than a thousand kilometers. Uh, and so, um, so I contacted uh, uh, the team. So the team leader is Yan Wei Pan, uh, photographed here. Uh, and um, the, the 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 first author on the experiment is uh, Yuan Yin, uh, who's down here. Um, I contacted them, and we this we have a sort of very preliminary uh, uh, collaboration on on an experiment like this. So let me explain. Uh, what what the technology is that they have, uh, and um, how it might work. Um, so these slides, incidentally, the next few slides were provided uh, to me by um, by uh, Yuan Yin. It's uh, from 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 uh, China. So um, in um, August 2016, they launched a satellite. So here's the, the satellite, um, um, and uh, on this satellite, there's a um, a two photon source, a source of entangled photons. Uh, the satellite uh, goes around um, the planet, goes around the planet Earth uh, once a day, and at a certain time every day, actually it's in the early hours of the night, of the morning, so it's about one o'clock in the morning or something, um, the satellite is in the right position to send uh, photons down to these two uh, receiving telescopes in two distant towns. The distance between these towns is 1,200 kilometers. Uh, and and uh, it's in the right position uh, at about one o'clock in the morning uh, every night for about 90 seconds. Uh, and during those 90 seconds, about um, 90 or 100 pairs of photons are, are detected. Okay, so, um, so that's the kind of data uh, that we have. So the proposal is to have um, a hundred people at each end, uh, in in the way I described, um, who's who with EG headsets, which is used to switch the setting uh, at each end uh, and to and to do the the bad experiment. Um, so if you take um, these numbers, if we have 1,200 kilometers, we have a hundred people at each end, uh, and a 10 hertz switching rate per person, then we'd expect to see close to a 100% effect. That the um, the switching, the the, the the locality conditions that I talked about would be um, imposed in roughly 100% of cases. Um, of course, this, this this calculation may be a bit naive. There are many other considerations, but at least it tells you that we're now in the right kind of ballpark, uh, and so um, the experiment uh, starts to um, become feasible. Okay. The next question is, uh, what if? What if quantum theory were violated in this experiment uh, in the direction of satisfying Bell's inequalities? So what if when you did this experiment with humans switching the um, settings, uh, you started to see, um, you know, rather than 2.8 for that correlation function, it went down in the direction of, uh, of 2. Um, well, this would be truly profound and significant. Um, the consequences for quantum foundations uh, would be very significant. Uh, it would show you that actually, contrary to what we thought, um, we do have uh, locality. So Bell's inequalities are actually satisfied when you do the experiment properly, where you impose the conditions, the locality conditions properly. Um, it would also indicate a kind of super determinism, because the only way uh, to account now for the violations of Bell's inequalities that we've seen in all the existing experiments would be to say 
that the earlier state of the switch at each end um, is um, it, uh, fully determines the later state of the switch and that this earlier state is, is communicated uh, to the other end. So you'd have a world which was um, you know, deterministic in a very strong way. So those will be the consequences for, for quantum foundations or for physics more generally. But these consequences would pale into insignificance compared with the importance of such a result for the study of mind. Uh, a result like this would provide, I think, very strong evidence for Cartesian duality. Although we can think about other explanations. Um, so, um, so um, yeah, I mean, when, when you have an experimental result, uh, it's, the actual interpretation of that is always open for discussion. Um, so it seems to me that a, a radical result like this, where where um, you see a violation, but only when humans or, or maybe other animals are involved, but not when artificial devices are, uh, would suggest that there was something different going on. Uh, you could attempt to um, account for this kind of result uh, in fully materialist terms. So here's a, here's a way you might try and do it. You might say that um, in order to impose the locality conditions, you need uh, machines that are complex in just the right kind of way. In particular, they are complex in the kind of way that happens inside inside brains, uh, uh, you know, brains of, of humans and so on, and uh, animals. Uh, and uh, it's only when you have that kind of complexity that you're able to uh, impose the, um, the locality conditions. Um, the, the problem with that kind of explanation um, is that it seems like a, a very sort of holistic kind of explanation. If, if, if nature is, is local, then you would expect it to be described by, you know, mic uh, local microphysical laws. Um, in which a case, in which case, it's um, it's it's difficult to see how this kind of holistic property could arise when you have sufficiently complicated systems. Um, nevertheless, one could explore uh, those kinds of ex explanations as well. But to my mind, an ex a result like this would be quite strong evidence for Cartesian duality. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this is a different way of discussing uh, consciousness in the context of quantum theory, in the context of quantum foundations. So I think everyone is used to this idea that you, you might use consciousness to solve the measurement problem. So the idea that uh, the wave function will collapse um, only when a conscious observer looks at it. So that idea has been around for, for uh, a long time, going back to people like um, um, von Neumann um, and, and others. Um, so there's a long history of thinking about uh, this um, this um, sort of um, of invoking consciousness in quantum foundations to solve the measurement problem. There's also the many minds interpretation uh, outlined by Michael Lockwood, uh, and then also many people would say that the Copenhagen interpretation is in, is in some sense um, a Cartesian dualist point of view. So uh, Nicholas Gizan makes that point in um, in um, a paper he wrote uh, a, a year or so ago on the interpretations. So what we have here is, is very much of a different flavor. Uh, we're invoking consciousness uh, in choosing settings, not in um, measuring outcomes. Um, OK, so this idea of using humans to switch the settings uh, in a Bell experiment is an idea I had um, you know, almost 30 years. Well, the idea I had 30 years ago and then I, I wrote two papers on it um, in 1989. Um, the first paper I, I, I typed up, that was before I knew how to use LaTeX. Um, and then the second paper I, I, start, I wrote when I, once I'd started my PhD. The, the reason, incidentally, I, I, I went to do my PhD with Ewan Squires was because he also had an interest in consciousness. Uh, and so, um, so um, it seemed like a good fit. Uh, here's a, a figure from the paper I wrote in, um, in uh, 1989, the first one. Uh, back in those days, you couldn't use computers to draw figures, or at least I couldn't. So this was drawn you know, by pen and ink. And, and the, the letters, you'd get these transfer kits, uh, and you'd, um, you'd rub uh, so that the letter would uh, stick to the, um, the, um, the, the paper. Um, OK, so that's the figure right there. And you can see 
the idea that, that the signal is collected via EEG headset uh, to the um, to the switching device at each end. Um, Ewan Squires uh, wrote a book uh, called Conscious Mind in the Physical World, uh, and uh, I, I've lost my copy, and I, I, I fear that I've been plugging this book so much that now, if you want to buy a copy. Uh, on Amazon, uh, you know, there's no, there's not, it's not currently in print. It's actually quite expensive, I've been told. Um, anyway, the book is, it's a nice book. It's quite a nice read, and it sort of, it's written from a physicist's point of view, and he talks about, um, uh, um, you know, conscious, uh, how you might uh, talk about consciousness in in the context of physics. Um, so he did discuss in this 1990 book uh, my proposal, um, and. Uh, um, so you look at the, if you look at this quote at the end, he says, unfortunately, the time scales uh, uh, involved suggest that they would be very difficult to perform. Uh, and certainly back in 1990, that was true. Oh, there's also a paper by uh, John Bell uh, in 1990 where he did m mention the idea of hu using humans or observers, he called them, to uh, experiment experimentalists to um, choose the settings. Uh, I think this was very much a remark he made in passing. Uh, he didn't discuss the issue of mind or, or consciousness. Uh, he was more concerned with imposing locality. And if you read that paper, it doesn't seem that he he would have taken very seriously the idea um, that that anything would come of using humans as opposed to random number generators uh, in a bell experiment. Anyway, since I... Um, since I wrote, since I uh, thought of this idea 30 years ago, uh, three things have changed. So first of all, um, attitudes have changed. Uh, I think now um, when you discuss these ideas, people take them more seriously. Um, the idea of using humans has been mentioned in a few of the experimental papers that have been published in recent years. Um, there was this experiment, uh, this, well, it was more of a, um, a, a sort of public outreach exercise called the, uh, the Big Bell Experiment that was done um, uh, a few years ago, um, where uh, there were bell experiments all over the world. Uh, there were separate sort of local bell experiments in laboratories, and um, they asked people over the internet to send in um, information, you know, like sort of send in, you know, um, uh, signals. So in some sense, this information that was going to decide the switching was coming from humans. But in that experiment, no attempt was made to um, impose locality conditions. Um, but I think it's sort of in the same... Um, you know, in the same spirit as the, the sort of proposal I'm talking about. Um, the other thing, of course, is is back in uh, back uh, in 1989, um, I, I didn't have tenure, and in fact, I, I very quickly got the sense that it, it wouldn't do my career any good to be publishing papers uh, on consciousness. Um, I did attempt to publish both those papers, but they were very quickly returned by the journals, uh, and so I I, I, I gave up uh, after a short while. Um, Back in 1989, I was very confident that if the experiment was performed, a positive um, result would be seen. Um, but by now, I think it's far less likely. So by now, I would say maybe 3% is the um, is, is the chance of a positive result. And when I say 3% to my colleagues, they usually think I'm a bit crazy. That's much too high. Most people would give a much lower percentage. Um, Nevertheless, even if you if, if you think the chance is one in a million or one in ten million, um, the the uh, if you if you multiply that by the sort of payoff in terms of our understanding of the world, were a positive outcome seen, um, then I, I think we get a very big number. Um, um, the, you know, the the implications of 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 some experiment that really uh, sh shone some light on the issue of consciousness uh, would would be would be very important. Um, Okay. Um, often people say that Cartesian dualism is not a valid scientific point of view. Uh, you know, the, often the point uh, people say implicitly or or, or explicitly uh, that really scientific points of view have to be materialist in their conception. Um, but if you can propose an actual experiment, um, then it shows you can address the issue of, of dualism uh, scientifically. Uh, and this is true, you know, even if the experiment were, were performed uh, and uh, uh, and um, a negative result was seen, so quantum theory continued to be um, satisfied. Uh, even in that case, 
Uh, no, the, the, the mere fact that you can talk about an experiment shows um, that uh, one can discuss things like Cartesian dualism um, in scientific terms. Okay, let me just see how much time I have. Um, I've been speaking for about um, about what time? About fifty? Is it about fifty minutes? Yeah. So I think I would say you have at least fifteen minutes left. So okay, good. Good. We started at thirty-four. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So uh, then, in that case, so the remaining slides are a little bit more technical, um, but um, I, I think they're, they're potentially interesting. So let me just um, go through those. So um, let me first of all define a concept I call retarded settings. So what are retarded settings? So if you look at this space-time diagram here, imagine we have some intervention, okay, um, and um, I'm thinking of uh, you know a human making a choice, so some mind intervening on matter, whereby you have a, an intervention, uh, and that intervention switches the setting in a Bell experiment, okay. Um, incidentally, can you see the cursor when I do this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. So here is the signal from the intervention to the um, to the um, the switch of the setting. Okay. And then um, you can imagine that information about this intervention spreads out at light speed. So here's a light cone. So here's the light speed signal reaching the other end. Um, so this switch is used uh, to set a, a, a measurement, which is performed here, at uh, this time here. And likewise, there's a measurement over here. So you can see, in this case, you have uh, satisfied the, the, the locality condition um, that the, the information for the switch uh, uh, at, for the setting at end A has not reached end B in time to influence the outcome of that measurement. And you can do the same thing in the other direction. So um, what is a retarded setting? Um, well, let's imagine the state of the switch box end A at time T is alpha T. This is the sort of hidden state. Um, um, so it may consist of uh, quantities, variables that appear in the fundamental theory uh, that are not directly accessible to experimentalists. Um, uh, so this state can describe any physical systems that can locally influence the setting at end A. So when I talk about the switch box, potentially this is a broader uh, category referring to you know all the um, physical um, um, the physical part of the world that can influence the um, the, the choice of setting at end A. Um, now, according to the assumptions we have, in the absence of interventions, this state um, this so this um, this state evolves deterministically uh, like this, um, and so the setting at time t is going to be given by the hidden state at time alpha at uh, time zero. Uh, this is alpha zero, uh, and we can choose time t equals zero to be the last time that a light speed signal can communicate the state of the machine at end a uh, to the measurement uh, event at end b. Okay, so alpha zero is some information that could be sent from end a to end b. If an intervention happens at um, a time t prime after t zero, then actually um, the new state alpha of t prime is not given uh, by the state alpha zero. Okay, and this is what we mean by an intervention. We mean something external that um, it cannot be predicted at the other time. Nevertheless, we can still define what we might call the retarded setting. So this is the setting that's chosen. Um, uh, sorry, the setting that would have been chosen had there not been an intervention. So th this is a function of alpha zero. So this is the um, the, the setting at time t that would have been chosen uh, had there not been an intervention. Okay. Um, okay. So that's a slightly odd concept, um, but basically um, the retarded setting is is the setting that N B believes the setting is going to be at end A. Okay. Oh. Let's see. Let's, um, let's see. Okay. So um, we can now derive Bell inequalities uh, using these retarded settings. Um, so the, out the outcome at end B can depend on the retarded setting at end A 
It can also depend on the local information at NB, so the set, the actual setting at NB and the retarded setting at NB. So uh, the outcome at NB can be given by a function of these things and also by some hidden variables, uh, as as is usual in derivations of Bell's inequalities. And similarly, we have the same thing at end A. Um, so now the um, outcome at end A can depend on the retarded setting at end B. Okay, let me just show that again. Right. Uh, so now we can derive Bell inequality. So we do that in the usual kind of way. So we use this mathematical result. Uh, we put we substitute in these uh, choices for these x's and y's. We integrate over lambda, and then you get these Bell inequalities. So these are retarded Bell inequalities because they um, have in them not just the actual settings but also the retarded settings. Okay. Um, if you look at these inequalities, if you if you force your actual and retarded settings to be equal, um, then each of these terms has to be the same thing. Okay. And then um, because you have a minus sign here, um, you just get two times the given correlation function. Uh, and since the correlation function can take a maximum value of one, um, we just get something which has to be true. Okay. So, um, so if the actual settings are equal to the retarded settings, uh, then there's nothing to test. The Bell inequalities uh, don't teach us anything in, in this kind of situation. Um, even if the setting is different at one end, you can make an argument that there's nothing uh, to test. Uh, if the setting is different at both ends, then there is something to be tested. Um, so that's the situation we want to um, realize. Okay. So what we can do is now we can build a model. If you look at Bell's original paper, um, from 1964, he had a model in it. Uh, and so um, emulating that, we can build a model. Um, so this model, I haven't I haven't used the local uh, retarded setting. Um, so it, well, it wasn't necessary. Um, so in this model, um, we have a hidden variable, lambda, which is just an angle, takes values between zero and two pi. And we imagine it wraps round. So if you add a number on it, which takes outside that range, you just put it back into um, into that um, range, treat it like an angle. We have a flat distribution over this hidden variable. And now um, we have these, um, these um, um, choices for these outcome functions. Well, if you substitute that into, um, into the expression for the correlation function, then you get this expression, okay? Um, so these angles, uh, theta r and theta l, are things that we can define um, um, uh, locally at each end. And in particular, uh, if we define theta l, this is on um, the angle on Alice's end, in terms of um, the, uh, the actual and retarded setting at that end, and likewise on the other end, uh, then we obtain uh, this value for the correlation function. Now, if the retarded settings are equal to the actual settings, then this just gives us the usual quantum result. So you can see here that by taking account of these retarded settings, you can get agreement with quantum theory. On the other hand, in this model, if, if, if A is not equal to AR uh, and or B is not equal to BR, uh, then you start to disagree with quantum theory. So in this model, it's sufficient to have the, the actual setting and the retarded setting different even at one end. So if A is different from AR, uh, then you will get a violation of quantum theory. Um, okay, so now I come to the, the conclusions. Um, so I proposed an experiment. The experiment's difficult, but it seems like it's, um, it's feasible. Um, what well, one thing this experiment depends on is um, this switching time. So I was assuming that people are capable of 10 hertz, so 10 switches per second, 10 interventions per, sec interventions per second. Uh, if that's not true, uh, then um, then 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 it would be more difficult to perform the experiment. If if people are only capable of a lower switching rate, then it's more difficult. Um, 
nevertheless, it seems like this kind of experiment is in the realm of the feasible. Uh, to perform an experiment like this would act as a kind of stretch goal. You know, it's very difficult to um, to do this, uh, and so it would push the technological um, push the technology you have. Um, it would open up the field of um, I call it BQI, brain quantum interface experiments, uh, in particular where timing is important. Um, it's very unlikely that uh, quantum theory would be violated. I think most people think quantum theory will sail through this test just like it sailed um, through previous tests, um, but it, it's possible. For me personally, um, it's super determinism, which is the thing that's hardest to believe. Um, so personally, I would, um, I, I, would, I would put a fairly high credence on something like mind-matter duality. Um, um, maybe I would give it sort of more like, you know, um, somewhere in the range of 30 to 50 percent. It, it seems to me that um, we need some radical change in physics to account for consciousness. Um, the, the hard problem of David Chalmers is, is a very significant one. Um, and um, even though mind-matter duality doesn't seem very scientific from the current point of view, um, that's just a, a sort of lack of experimental data. Um, so um, I, I put a fairly high credence in that. On the other hand, um, um, it, it seems to me that the, this sort of super deterministic account of nature is 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 is, is unpleasant. Um, and um, I would rather believe in non-locality than super determinism. Um, so um, so I, I find that hard to believe in. And certainly my work in quantum gravity moves goes very much in the opposite direction. It seems that arguments, um, seems that um, uh, indefinite causal structure, uh, fundamentally indefinite causal structure would be uh, uh, completely inconsistent with super determinism. Uh, nevertheless, it's not, it's not for me to decide the actual nature of nature that's for experiment. If the experiment was done and, 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 a, and a, um, a violation of quantum theory was seen, then um, we would have to deal with that uh, result. Um, it would be a tremendously significant result, uh, especially because of the um, issue of um, mind. Uh, if, 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 um, if we saw a, a violation of quantum theory, then we'd have to um, perform more experiments with more complex inanimate systems, you know, more complex um, computers, maybe we could find a, a, some software that would um, would um, also get the same result, and also other types of animate systems. Um, so what are the odds? I, I, I'm, I'm saying 3%, although, um, you know, if you say 1 in a million or 1 in 10 million, that seems fine as well. Uh, of course, in the end, uh, having probabilities over different physical theories is, is kind of a nonsense uh, the, 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 it's a sort of meta probabilities. It, it doesn't really make any sense. It, so in the end, we just have to do the experiment. Um, yeah. So this question, I think I just alluded to this. Uh, do we need to use humans, or, or will penguins do? Um, there's this rumor that Roger Penrose, who, who is uh, has worked on consciousness, of course, uh, has a pet penguin, uh, and uh, and indeed uh, this looks like some photographic evidence for that. Uh, he was telling me. Um, um, at this a conference I went to a short while ago, it was a conference on consciousness. Uh, he was telling me um, um, that there was this rumor that was on, on his Wikipedia page uh, that he had a, a, a penguin, but he stated that on his Wikipedia page. And then eventually the, um, you know, the moderators took it off his Wikipedia page and he was very disappointed that he'd lost his penguin. Um, anyway, um, here's some evidence in favor of that. Um, and, um, you know, whenever I, whenever I want to think about consciousness, Often I, I think back to this picture I saw in in Roger's book. I'm sure everyone has seen it. Uh, um, it's you know here he, here's a quote from him: uh, Platonic, mathematical, physical, and mental. So each has its own kind of reality, uh, and each is um, deeply and mysteriously founded in the one that precedes it. Um, um, I'm not sure anything I had to say today directly bears on this picture. Maybe it would indicate that the arrow, at least one of the arrows, is pointing also in the other direction. Um, uh, but um, consciousness is certainly a very uh, mysterious uh, subject, and um, it would be nice if we could make um, some um, empirical uh, progress. Okay, and I'll stop there. <laughs>